be a dual citizen, but you can't be a trio, trio or a cuatro. Okay, we're rolling John anytime. What's your first question? Well, my first question no, is no. Uh, just sometimes it'll be a question, sometimes it'll just be a quote, and maybe it'll prompt you or something. And the quote was, I was astonished that any student had the manner, the diction, the hauteur of Jane Austen's snotty hero. Do you remember that quote? I mean, it's a long time ago. No, they're going to hear you say that, aren't well, they? Well, no. Uh, I'll the, be gone. I'll then how, then how, how, well, I'll look like I'm <laughs> reading all my reviews. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> now you're going to set it up. Yeah. Thank you very much. That'll leave me in the lurch. I think that was Herbert Whittaker, if I'm not mistaken, a familiar ring uh, to his kind of style. I was, uh, yeah, I was 15. I played Darcy in, in uh, the Montreal High School production of Pride and Prejudice. And that's when I really, the bug bit me. I thought, I, but Darcy was such a wonderful part. And I thought, God, if all parts are like that, then I, then I better go into this profession. He's good looking, rich, urbane, <laughs> it's witty, attractive, women adore him. Yeah, I think this is for me. And uh, so I enjoyed myself because I hated, I didn't particularly care for school and I wasn't doing very well at it. So um, Herbie really was responsible, as I said in that little um, tribute to him the other night, for me going into the business. He's got a lot to answer for. Um, you spent a lot of time supposedly learning a little of your craft, not in the theater, but in the Montreal club scene. Yeah. Well, I've written about that. I'm writing a book and, uh, for my sins. Uh, and I'm dealing with Montreal in the, f in the 40s and late 30s, and of course the 50s. Uh, I remember it from mid-40s on. And, it, and uh, I, I, I'm not going to blow my entire book on this program. But it's, some, it's, a, it's a part of Montreal that hasn't been written about a great deal, or, or it hasn't been written about by kind of bar rags like myself, who haunted every club when I was a kid. And I, I, I just fell in love with nightlife and the, and the idea of entertainment, beyond, and particularly in uh, ca café, um, cabaret, uh, because I, I couldn't believe that anybody who was that talented could hold an audience of drunks and if they could do that, my God, they must be pretty damn good. And what a kind of wonderful discipline that makes you. So I, I kind of followed the big stars around Montreal when I was 14, actually. I used to sit in Chez Paris with a nursing a beer all night, and I would watch Lucien Boyer, Ch uh, Charles Trenet, Maurice Chevalier, Frank Sinatra. Uh, I don't think Edith Piaf came to Montreal. But uh, we had Jacqueline Francois. We had all the great European French singers and Billy Daniels and God knows who from, uh, from the States. And uh, we even had Carl Brisson from Denmark, who was one of, one of the great nightclub entertainers. And, and the jazz in every part of that city. Uh, there were almost 400 um, nightclubs in that town. There was more <laughs> nightclubs than every day of the year. And you see, because you had all the different languages, you know. Montreal in those days was a very international city in this country. It, uh, so all the, the international business was attracted to the city that boasted St. James Street, uh, which ran the country in those days. So it was an exciting, wonderful time. And m I can never remember any sort of real um, edge to a relationship between French, Canadian, and the English. We were, as far as I was concerned, we were pals to the death. And we uh, enjoyed skiing, art, music, everything just the same as anybody else did. I think there was a, perhaps a, my fa I was lucky because my family spoke French and we had a great many French friends. But it was a much more general feeling of, of, of goodwill in those days, and it turned later s slightly sour. And I, God knows I don't blame them. Just a minority went out of control, and it became ridiculous. But um, it, was a, it was a great time, and I'm going to bore everybody solid about it. I've got some pretty good stories, actually. I'm sure you do. Yeah. In 1950, I believe it was 1950, you, uh, you joined the Mount Playhouse in the first season. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, the first thing I really did was uh, Rosanna 
Seaborn Todd, who was a friend of our family, and who lived in, their family bought my great-grandfather's old house in Seneville, which is outside of Montreal. And they, um, so they grew up, I grew up with them, as it were. They were slightly older than I was. Um, Rosie would be the next generation, but she was a great friend, and she was an actress, very, very good, and she had a career in England. But uh, they had a lot of money, and uh, she sort of was at a loose end, and she didn't know what to do, so she decided to start an open-air playhouse on the, on the mountain, Shakespeare. And she got people extraordinary with her drive. She got people like Komisaryevsky to come over. And, uh, he was then the guru of theater in, in Europe, the Old Vic, and the Imperial Theater in Moscow. And he had the most extraordinary reputation. He'd, he worked with Pe he was married to Peggy Ashcroft, and he'd worked with John Gielgud. He'd worked with everyone at the Old Vic, Olivier, everyone. And he was considered probably the, one of the great directors of this century. She managed to hook him, bring him to Montreal, age 70, and there he was directing Cymbeline, a, a very strange modern dress version of same, uh, with a lot of people that you know in, in it, starting out young, people like Bob Goodyear and Dickie Easton and all sorts of people. Bill Shatner was, my, was in it playing Cloten, I remember. Um, and she had a lot of drive and, and spirit, and she started to pay the actors. She started to pay one or two. Um, I don't think she paid me because I was a friend of the family, so I was out. Uh, um, but she began a kind of semi-professional company, indeed as Joy Thompson did at the uh, Mountain Playhouse. Joy Thompson, sadly, uh, has just recently died. Uh, but there was an extraordinary personality, too, um, a dynamo, a real dynamo. Well, built, she built all her own sets. She was a terrific set designer. She, was, she had gone to school in New York at the Irwin Piscata School with uh, Marlon Brando and Elaine Stritch, who were both her great buddies. In fact, she looked a bit like Marlon Brando. She was, had a wonderful sort of Grecian torso in those days. I'm not talking about the modern Marlon Brando, I'm talking about the one. And, uh, except that she was very feminine inside, so she, also her sort of rather manly, striking appearance, she wore ties when that wasn't fashionable, you know. And uh, She was a great, great lady, funny, uh, obstreperous, talented, so multi-talented that it, that it ruined her, actually. She didn't, she didn't know wh where to channel or focus her real talent, which was actually set designing. She was a wonderful artist. She started the Mountain Playhouse, in which I appeared, yeah. Did you, many plays there. You played. You appeared with uh, Amelia Hall in White Oaks. Remember? Yes. What do you remember? I mean, obviously Amelia Hall is gone now, but what are your memories of her? Well, oh, Millie, uh, I adored Millie. She was. <laughs> I used to love shocking her, you know, because she was a, a little fussy little sweetheart of a lady, who was tiny. She was only about five feet, and very pretty. But she she was sort of uh, rather like Spring Byington used to be in the movies. Uh, I always called her the Canadian Helen Hayes. I think that she probably was the closest thing to a sort of grand lady of the theater that we had in, our, in this country. But she was also cute and pert, and she could play certain parts um, absolutely wonderfully. The Glass Menagerie, she was wonderful. I played Tom to her Amanda in Glass Menagerie at the, when she began the Ottawa, uh, when she took over the Ottawa Rep, which was uh, the Stage Society, which became the Canadian Repertory Theater. But in those days, she was way back at the old mountain playhouse there, playing uh, Madame in, in White Oaks. Those two were the two top uh, sort of amateur semi-pro theaters, along with MRT, Montreal Rep, which I began at, actually, which Herbert Whitaker used to design sets for, also direct. And we used to work equally with the French in those days. I mean, Pierre Dagenet was one of the top directors uh, in the province of Quebec, and, and he worked equally with us in the on the English side as he did with his own French boys on the on the east. We were always mixing and interplaying, a thing that only happened again at Stratford when Michael Langham did the Henry V in uh, '56, where he brought the Théâtre du Nouveau Monde and brought them all uh, us together. Sadly, it didn't happen enough. You mentioned uh, Pierre Dagenet and. Uh I guess one of the productions that came out in the research was Asmodee. Uh, Asmo one of his more uh, yes, that's right. I, I was 16 <laughs> playing that. 
Uh, God knows what I was like, I can't remember at all. But uh, I remember he was very colorful. I was terribly impressed watching him. He was very theatrical, <laughs> the way he spoke and the way he did it. Asmodee was a, one of those sort of boulevard plays, perhaps it was a little bit better, by Francois Mauriac. And uh, I, I didn't care what the play was, as long as I was on stage and working with people. It was exciting. Basta. Of course, what was going on all at the same time, enabling us to, to to sort of make a career as actual professional actors in a country that had never <laughs> had a, a professional theater. They'd only been used to touring companies post uh, pre-war. And then this was post-war and, and the beginnings of a real Canadian expression, actually, strangely enough, whatever that is. And the radio uh, was very alive and such a great medium, miss it today terribly. That kept us going. So we could actually earn a living and then do plays at the theaters dotted around the place which were not paying enough to, for, for our livelihood. But I made a lot of money in, in radio in those days as a kid of 17. I was doing pretty well. And in Montreal in those days there were about seven or eight soap operas a day on, on uh, French and English. And I would play on both and so would Bill Shatner. Bill Shatner played in French too. I played in French. John Colicos played in French. Um, I think a couple other people too, of the, of the English set played. We interchanged all the time. The French played on our, uh, it, was, it was absolutely wonderful. And then we had those huge hour long, three hour long special programs um, produced by Rupert Kaplan, who was the senior radio producer then in the, on the English network. We would do the ambitious things like O'Neill and Ibsen and, and Shakespeare and and, and a lot of very original writing that was also coming out of Toronto. Lester Sinclair and um, Reuben Shipp and writers of that sort of uh, uh, caliber. Joseph Shule. So there was a pile of wonderful radio and I think that radio actually, um, the original stuff that was coming out of Canadian radio was really the, the, probably the closest we've ever got to forming our own uh, artistic uh, kind of identity in this country uh, because it was very uniquely of Canada. Uh, that whole group that you've, you've, you've already discussed with Maver Moore and all that group and Tommy Tweed and Bud Knapp and Lauren Green, all, all those guys John Draney, who was probably the greatest radio actor that ever lived anywhere. That's a, that is a quote from Orson Welles. Orson told me that many years later. He said, you, you've got a guy up there in Canada who knocks us all for six. And it's true. He could play anything and suggest with his voice. He could be a woman one day. It could be anything. It was extraordinary. He was a genius in, in front of the microphone. We had a lot of extraordinary talent. And then suddenly, Andrew Allen, who was the mastermind in Toronto, and Rupert Allen, uh, Rupert Kaplan disappeared. Uh, they couldn't either of them make the transition into television. And when radio died, a whole art form here died. And it's still the sitting in the CBC, some of those miraculous shows, yellowing with age. Do you remember uh, any sort of particular moments that sort of give a sense of what it was like? I mean, uh, stand out in a particular show or something that happened? Uh, well, yes. I, I, I was constantly being fired, personally. Uh, uh, one day I was, I was in about two, two French soap operas and I was doing Laura Limited, which was an English soap opera. It was Rupert Kaplan directing. And one other, and I was so confused. I thought, oh God, we've got a lunch break. So I went with my friends across the road on Dorchester Street and we sat down in a little pub that all the radio people used. I'm drinking away merrily. I don't have any more work that day. And they, <laughs> they turn the, the, radio, the radios on. The radio was always on in the pub, so you could tell what was happening over at the building across the road. And there was my show. And then somebody was announcing my death. <laughs> and I was playing a character in French called Ari Fanning. He was the English boy. And uh, so I was playing in a French accent, but my name was Harry Fanning. I hear well, Ari, Ari Fanning suddenly fell down a mine shaft. <laughs> Something they got, they got rid of me. Here I am listening, sitting, drinking.
That was how I got fired on one show. Yeah. It was too confusing. It was too much work. It was, we were so lucky. <laughs> was uh, going back just quickly to uh, well, actually, while we're on the radio, yeah, we've heard a lot of different descriptions of uh, what it was like to work with Andrew Allen, uh, uh, the yeah. rehearsal process. But what was it for you? I mean, you oh yeah, I I wish I'd been there from the very beginning. I got there the last two years of his reign as the. the as a top man, I absolutely adored him. Um, he wasn't cuddly, <laughs> that's for sure. But actually he was, later on underneath. He had a terrific vulnerability and a, and a, a lovely sensitivity as a man, but he, which he always was hiding with that highland pride of his. Um, he was, I, I honestly think he was a genius, I, I do. Just as John was a genius of a radio actor, Andrew was an extraordinary producer. He had elegance, he had style, and he brought to this sort of raw country a kind of style. He made us play uh, on a, w w with a sort of stature that it was on another plane. And he, he did such ambitious things. He not only was terrific doing restoration comedy on the air, I mean, can you believe, which was done superbly well. Elegant, beautifully done, just as good as anything coming from the BBC Third program, which we used to exchange in those days. We did an exchange with the BBC Third, and uh, he'd go over there, and Val Gielgud would, would come over here and direct. Uh, and then at the same time, he encouraged original writing and did, did, did all, and, and actually nurtured these, these writers that, that I mentioned a minute ago, Joe Shule and all the boys. He, he, he guided them. He had extraordinary taste and insight. When NBC uh, needed help in New York, they called Andrew. If they, if they were doing a, a huge broadcast, they didn't know how to do it. They had, he would go down and he said, my God, they had 20 mics all over the place. He just took them all away and used one. I mean, he, he taught people about radio that should have known. Uh, Orson was... Um, terribly impressed with them. I use Orson because Orson had such a huge and marvelous rep radio reputation. And Orson got Fletcher Markle, who was Andrew's protege, in, in, into the uh, American scene. I remember that, I think it was that program that Orson had on the other, that he always introduced himself as your humble servant, Orson Welles. And, he w and this particular time, he didn't direct, he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is your humble servant, Orson Welles, and I'm turning over my entire reign to a young man from the north, Fletcher Marco. And he sort of introduced him to the world over the, over the airways. Um, Andrew had worked on radio shows with Kurt Weill, uh, Brecht. I mean, he knew everybody. An extraordinary man, and yet very modest, and never trumpeted his fame or and hated publicity. He just went on giving one more excellent, and then it all disappeared, like so much chaff. And we had to, this whole country had to start again, pull itself up, and we had no leader. We really didn't have a leader in 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 the sense of Andrew Allen, till Tyrone Guthrie came to this country. They were of, uh, 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 although they were totally different as people, um, they were of the same larger-than-life, extraordinary, ilk, rare, rare people that, you, that you're very lucky to have known and worked with at a, at a, at a stage in one's life when, it was, when you were impressionable enough and, and, and it was very valuable. I'm jumping, but we'll continue in the flow. Um, well, that's the entire history of Canada anyway. I've just, <laughs> I've just wrapped it up. Uh, <laughs> He was an outrageous man, funny as hell, with an enormous intellect. He'd inspire you to go on and on for him. He was delicious to show off in front of. Then he'd say, I think we'd better cut all that out. Much too much. <laughs> the Tony, yes. Um, well, you've said it. Now, what am I going to say? Uh, <laughs> well, what, what did he mean to you? I mean, what, 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 can you give examples of sort of what, what he showed you? Or well, uh, I mean, uh, there are others who, who, who have worked more with Guthrie than I have, except that we did hit it off very well. Finally, uh, he, he, I was arrogant, terribly arrogant in those days, and had come from Broadway. I, I came in the other direction. 
I had to go to Broadway before my own country hired me. <laughs> it's so, so typical, isn't it? Uh, and when I came back, I brought all that chip with me, you know. And so he, I, I was doing egg your cheek for him in Twelfth Night, and and one day I was was late because I was, let's face it, I was hungover. I was late for rehearsal, and uh, when I got there, the entire company was seated there with absolutely with not a word. They just stared at me as I walked in. And this amazing tall eagle of a man was standing there, absolutely impassive, staring at me with those fierce sort of vulture eyes. And he said, uh, what would you like for breakfast? Because we're all going to sit down and watch you eat it. <laughs> I mean, it was diabolical. And you know, I was, what, 26? God, I could have shot myself. So he, he, he pulled me together, and then I, uh, and he was so generous that uh, he forgave in, in a second. And I worked my nut off for him. He was an audience of a thousand people when he directed. And uh, I think all the great directors that I've been lucky enough to work with, and I, there are at least three or four, Kazan being another one, um, have that. They are. They are the audience because they encourage, they can be tyrants, but they also fill you with confidence, which is a lot of insecure directors, which is like 85%, uh, want to show off their knowledge, put their stamp. A really great director is so confident that he just wants to bring the best out of you and recognizes what is the best in you when you don't know it yourself. T T Tony was one of those. Did you feel a lot of pressure? I mean, um, of course, you just said you came from Broadway, being the first Canadian, the youngest to sort of lead Stratford. Was that after yes, Broadway, uh, was that sort of a step down, or was that a big moment? Oh, no, no, that was a big moment, because the, the Stratford Festival had miraculously opened, and that was a huge moment, because everybody on, in New York and e England, too, were they, they really uh, pricked up their ears with this new success. And the Brooks Atkinson and Walter Kerr both championed it. Atkinson of the New York Times and Walter Kerr of the New York Herald Tribune both uh, were, were behind it in a huge way. And it really was a very glittering place in those days. So it was an extraordinary um, honor to, to be asked to, to, to head the company, particularly as I was the first young Canadian really to head the company. And, um, Yes, of course, <laughs> I felt a lot of pressure because those sons of bitches who were in the, <laughs> in the company, like Dougie Campbell and all those guys, just made my life miserable. Oh, I see. A Broadway star, are we? Okay. What's the matter with your voice? You can't reach that high note? You know? <laughs> oh, God, they, they, really, they really left me feeling very inadequate. Not for long. Not for long. Speaking of uh, singing, uh, when we interviewed Gordon Pinson, I don't even know if you remember this or not, but he was in a play with you at Stratford where he had to sing something to introduce you, but he was singing so, well, he was also laughing a couple times, so, but he, he was singing so low that you kept, wondering, you kept asking if he could sing any louder or something. Do you remember that? Uh? No, I don't actually, but I just, re but I do remember, <laughs> I do remember whenever I looked at Gordon on the stage, we both went into hysterics. I don't know, there was... He, Gordon was playing the most terribly minuscule parts that season, and I couldn't understand why he was there. Here was this interesting looking, extremely sort of noble head, and a, a mind that was obviously far beyond any of ours, playing walk-ons. And every time I look, he had that bemused, you know, that all the bemused look that is now famous with Gordon. But in those days, when we, he wasn't famous. But there was that look, and uh, he would just sit there with that silly, superior smirk on his face, and it, we would just, it was like walking out and seeing a complete stranger. He'd wandered in from some other planet. I, it was terribly funny. And of course, he had that lovely, wonderful sense of failure in, in his humor, that dark black humor that he's always had. Now, I don't remember asking him to sing louder. I probably did, though, because he invited, uh, he, he constantly invited you to send him up or uh, give him a rough time. 
Although I, I imagine most of the performances did run smoothly. You, there, you've been quoted about stories that stuck out in your memory, and uh, one of them was the one with the honor guard, who played, the actor playing the honor guard who fell into the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If I tell all these stories again, I, I'm going to not finish my book. <laughs> but because <laughs> that, that that story is in it, but uh, that was that disastrous matinee of Hamlet, I think, or one of the matinees where we were, which where we had all gone out to a big party the night before, and didn't realize that we had a matinee, that the management had actually scheduled a matinee right after the opening night of Twelfth Night. I mean, ah, oh, please, what a diabolical thing to do! So we had to, and Max Heltman, who. Who, who hadn't even bothered to go home. He was still celebrating in his, <laughs> his dressing room at noon the next morning. Started to leave. He I guess he ran out of booze and he started to go home. And we met him going, going, going from the theater. And I said, no, no, Max, turn around. Turn around because there's a matinee. Oh, he just turned around and went back into his dressing room, put on his stuff, his green slime that he put. He was playing the ghost. And actually, just needed to no makeup at all. He should have just walked on. His, his whole face was so green and horrible. And we went up to the top of that balcony, which was new to us all in those days. And they'd taken all the lights down below us, so it was just a pin spot on the ghost and Hamlet. And I mean, how we got up there, I'll never know, because we were really still quite drunk. And uh, I had to hold on to. Can you imagine holding on to a ghost? It doesn't, it's not, not very realistic, but I thought I had to hold on to his feet so that neither of us would fall to our deaths over this perilous precipice. Because you couldn't see anything below. They'd taken all the lights out on the stage. But, and then when he, when he finally says, ah, the, I hear the morning car <laughs> or something, and I, the matin uh, is near, and he, 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 he starts to leave. Uh, he has to go down the stairs, and he had this fiberglass armor on, and he kept bouncing against the wall as he went down the stairs. He didn't find his way. It was like, like this, and he, <laughs> he was ricocheting, and I, it took forever to get down the bloody stairs. I thought, the audience is going to leave in a minute. I mean, I, we've got to get on with this play. Finally, Max gets down, and you can hear in the tunnel, remember me, <laughs> as he sort of ricochets off everything, all the way down the noisiest bloody ghost you've ever heard in your life. I said, remember you, how could I forget? And then I finally went on, that later on that same day, I think it was, the a young French kid who was <laughs> playing one of the monks, actually. Um, we opened the trap door on the stage. We used the trap as the grave. And I had just done that thing as Hamlet, you know, 40,000 brothers could not, with all their quantity of love, make up my sum. And I grab Ophelia and I hold her to myself and put her down and leave the storm out of the grave. And the door is still open. And just before it closes, the kid trips and falls in <laughs> with the grave with Ophelia. And instead of coming right out, the idiot stays there. <laughs> so the guys, the soldiers, I mean, we kept saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nothing. It was too late. They had to go on with the play, so they closed the trap on top of him. So I, I always thought that the audience had one thing on their mind, necrophilia. <laughs> one other thing about, you mentioned it briefly, but it was, as you say, it was quite a significant moment at Stratford when Michael Langham invited the theater to do it on to the to Stratford. Uh, do you have any memories of that and how it melded or didn't? That was probably the most uh, wonderful, fun, and the most moving and touching and loving year I can possibly remember, uh, apart from the fact that Henry V was a wonderful su success and it was a terrific for me. But apart from that, what was most wonderful about it was the marriage of, the, of, our, of those two cultures. And the fact that those boys were so, uh, ex such extraordinary actors and such extraordinary human beings. Um, Jean Gascon, uh, who became one of my very best friends I've ever had, uh, was, a, was a gargantuan figure uh, in this country. Uh, he had he had all the sort of size of a Pierre Brasseur, uh, 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 
Remu. I mean, he had all those people, all those sort of creatures in France were all rolled into one with him, and he had he had a huge influence and personality and and joie de vivre. I mean, he was funny, he was gregarious, he was just divine, and his very dry, sweet but intellectual partner Jean Louis Roux, uh, who had a wonderful kind of dry wit. Uh, I adored all of them: Roger Garceau, Guy Hoffman, who died. Uh, a great clown, uh, Georges Gru, uh, oh God, I can go on and on and on, the girls, uh, Huguette Oligny and uh, Monique Mercure. We had, I, I've never had so much fun and that whole company responded to them and they brought such a style onto the stage with them, it was another life. And that it made that play work, my God. I mean, if Shakespeare had seen this, uh, I think he would have loved it because it, it, it really was another world when, when they appeared. And Tanya Mozievich had done a wonderful job with, the, with their costumes, making them so elegant, and we so raw and rough, the poor, condemned English. And uh, it, there was a real, honest to God, great contrast, and the, and the wonderful thing was it wasn't as if it was uh, arranged as a casting stroke of genius. It was our country. And just by accident, it was all on that stage at the same time. Amicable and working for each other and the arts. And sadly, it never happened really again. There was talk of it. In fact, Michael wanted to do it again. I wanted to mount some production once of Caesar and Cleopatra using, I tried to rack my brains to see how we can get the French and the English together, or the Indian and the French and the English together, <laughs> a real ethnic hodgepodge, and, uh, but none of them came to fruition. Do any of the, does any of the rehearsal moments in the rehearsal stand out for you and that when you were melding the two cultures together into the play? Oh, well, no, you, you just little things like uh, uh, Fridolin, you know, uh, Gatia Angelina playing uh, the, 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 who was famous for his Chicoc uh, character in, this, in Quebec and all over this country, actually. He was really the Fernandel of, of, of uh, Canada. He, uh, playing the King of France, a sort of frail little man, dying in his throne and suddenly arousing in that wonderful speech where he rouse, rouses the, all the first families of France together to, to fight Harry of England. And he says, you dukes of Brabant, Orléans, Bar, Boussico, Charleroi, and he, and he lists this wonderful, and, and as he, this dying little man, as he goes through this long list of these great old names, stands up and he becomes 10 feet tall. And uh, that was an exciting moment. He, n he never, that great speech always gets the, the shivers down my back anyway, but, but particularly when done by someone who was sort of shaky and, and, and dying. And, uh, and then Gascon striding about the stage like some sort of great um, orc as the constable of France, and very superior and very disdainful of the peasant English. But wonderful summer. Someone else who uh, I would have liked to speak to, unfortunately, Kate Reed, you worked with it a few times. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got I've got loads about Kate in my book, which I can't tell you anyway. It's all m much too sort of risque to, t to say on a program like this. No, and but I've known her since we were well. I guess I've known her since we were both twenty, nineteen twenty. Yeah, she was a great great friend, and uh, sort of rather we had a rather kind of giggly brother and sister relationship through our through our lives. Naughty, we always were getting into trouble, and Kate and I were always searching for trouble because it was so much more interesting than anything else. Uh, and uh, one didn't realize uh, that uh, when I deal with it in my book, I, 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 I talk about how uh, she was so good at a kind of um, light comedy and um, attractive comedy in the vein of Catherine Hepburn in Philadelphia Story, uh, in the vein of later on, Grace, well, she was a hell of a lot better actress than Grace Kelly, but, uh, but that kind of a skillful, uh, attractive, light comic. It would, didn't realize until she started to play parts in Bermuda. Uh, she was then married to Michael Sadler, who ran the company, of which I became her, her leading man. 
when she played in a in a Playboy of the Western World of Sings, the part of Pegine Mike, in which she was superlative suddenly, and you suddenly realize, no, 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 this is this is bigger stuff than what we've been seeing. This charming, pleasant, um, skillful little soubrette is now becoming a really big actress. She she was uh, she was only about twenty twenty one. Buzz Meredith, Burgess Meredith was was her. Uh, Christy Mann, and the two of them were just magic in that play. And then you realized that she was a, a, a big talent and, and had to be reckoned with. I should say something. The chances of this film being out before your book is... What film? This documentary. Oh. So I think you'll probably beat me to the punch anyway. You, you think you're going to still be interviewing people? Well, for, it's for, of, <laughs> of, of editing. And you're going to have to interview them from the, the grave, man. Five years probably by the time it sees the airways. But anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to make you feel, you don't have to worry about the Now, there's so much to talk about that actually, as I'm sort of revealing it, I don't tell the actual little stories as that, that accompany the, the one. I'm trying to pick them up. Yeah. yeah. Um, the trouble is, with my book, um, and this is a plug, of course, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> um, the trouble is, my book, I can't deal too much uh, the way I want to uh, in Canada, I have to make it as a sort of romance. Bec so it goes through the 50s and 40s with the speed of light because my American publishers and my English, I've got both. <laughs> they always say, get out of Canada as fast as you can. Right, right. I said, but fellas, I, why ask me to write it? I'm Canadian. So you're going to have to put up with an awful lot of Canadian history, actually. But I promise I'll make it as entertaining as I possibly can. And it is, anyway. So they've read it and like it very much. That's it. Okay. It'll be on the book. Wait, how much will it be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1958, A Winter's Tale. One of the reasons I wanted to maybe talk, if you could talk about this a bit, was Bruno Cherusi. I mean, I've lost the opportunity to speak with him, so I try to capture him a little bit through people I speak with. Bruno uh, was uh, our pride and joy, is the kind of guy who always defended us. I remember whoever we got into on those late, late parties that we used to far into the night after the show was down and there was nothing else to do in Stratford, Ontario but to go, go absolutely ape. Um, either slit your throat or <laughs> or get roaring drunk. And we always got into terrible arguments and fights and during the long nights and Bruno was always in there separating us or egging us on. He was the sort of little kind of prize fight manager. Sort of, he should have played in those early Frank Capra movies as the little guy who says, okay, fellas, now then get into the corner and we'll, we'll talk about this. And, and he used to get so emotional, he, he'd end up getting more emotional than we, and we'd sit there watching him and try to separate him. Wonderful, wonderful little guy with an enormous passion for the theater and a passion for life. And um, I, I don't know what else I can say about him. He was a terrific character actor because he, he always looked older than he was, except his Romeo, which everybody said, Bruno Gerussi playing Romeo. Come on, guys, just because his name is Gerussi, you don't give him an Italian part I mean, every day. I mean, think about it. The fella's, what, <laughs> 18? And, and Bruno is that high. He's short and dumpy, for God's sake. Come on, guys. And Julie Harris was, uh, came up from New York to play a, a rather lovely, wistful Juliet. She was beautiful. He was wonderful. It was, it was better than wonderful in, in a sense because he, he, he wasn't the most lyrical of, of actors, even though he spoke poetry very well indeed. He didn't ha that wasn't his thing to be. He was romantic, but he wasn't necessarily lyrical in the poetic sense in the Romeo sense of the word. But what he was was so utterly human because here was a Romeo that wasn't the expected pretty boy that you usually see. He, he was actually a man with a lot of character in his face and desperately in love. And uh, it had more reality because of that than, than, than almost any other Romeo I've ever seen because it was unexpected. So it worked a treat. 
used to have, there was a thing called Breakfast at Bruno's. Was, a, was that a, a pop, popular spot for people to... Uh, oh, well, I know, that was uh, long after I, I had gone out of the country. And uh, he had that he, he had that wonderful program. He asked me to be on it once. I couldn't think of a, a recipe. <laughs> I couldn't think past, in those days, sort of the, 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 the aperitif. So I, 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 and I racked my brains and he got fed up and he didn't ask me anymore. But uh, I would love to have gone on. I'm going to go back a bit because there's a, the Jupiter theory really intrigues me uh, because of the people that were involved in it. Uh, and there's a quote here, I don't know if you'd say you'd agree, uh, Len Peterson said, we're not established and we were considered radical and not quite safe. And you had Lauren Green, you had John Draney. Uh, what do you mean? I guess, how did you get involved with the, uh, the Jupiter? Do you know, I can't remember. I think because I hadn't worked for Andrew Allen yet. I, I had gone, gone to Toronto with my friend Michael Caine, the Canadian Michael Caine, not the, the British actor, Madman. And, um, I was sort of haunted the studios for a while. I'd left Montreal and I just wanted to get out and try something else. And I think somebody asked me, I can't remember who it was, I honestly can't remember who it was. I didn't audition for it, I know that. They asked me to do Alcibiades. They saw me in a bar drunk one night, I said, oh, Alcibiades, that's, that's him. <laughs> And uh, so I had a wonderful time in that. I, I, I instantly went to, to see a John Barrymore movie because I sort of modeled him on John Barrymore, this drunk, drunken sort of handsome creature that Alcibiades was. And then I, that's where I got to know Frank Petty and um, Lister, who had written the play. It was kind of rather a wonderful play. And all sorts of other guys in it that were top radio actors at the time, and I think that got me. Uh, Andrew was quite impressed with, with what I'd done when he came and saw it, and, and that's what got me into the stage series on radio. Uh, so I was very gr grateful to, to that. Theory. It was a very ambitious group. It was all those guys, and they, and they indeed were not safe. They were original plays, and uh, except for The Ladies Not For Burning, which I, I did later for them. That was about the, one of the only few plays written by a, a, an author from another country. And that was very successful, that particular Ladies Not For Burning, yes, I love what a lovely play that is. It's still about the only one of his that can be revived and, and, and still work uh, of Christopher Fry's. Do you remember the theater space that you had to work in? Yeah, it was pretty ghastly, I remember. I, I don't remember it very well, because I wanted to forget it, actually. There was no room to sort of hang about backstage. There was no backstage. I think we sort of made our exits into the lobby on the back. <laughs> uh, had a cigarette and then came back on again. It was pretty rough. I don't even remember where it was. It's in the uh, museum. It was, uh, That's right. It was, uh, That's right. <laughs> but I didn't know Toronto very well, so somebody had to sort of point me in the direction every night to where, <laughs> where the theater was I was going to play in. You probably encountered that a lot in the early days of the theater spaces. Well, the theater spaces were uh, absolutely a comment on, on, on what the, the general Canadian, or the, uh, the hierarchy, perhaps I should blame them more than the general Canadian, because the general Canadian, the average Canadian was not allowed to see, <laughs> to see us. Uh, it was the sort of close-knit group that ran the media and that kept us down. <laughs> um, if you keep art down, You'll be doing a good thing, my man. And so the, so the little spaces they gave us, like toilets and church basements and, and uh, back street alleys and stuff to play in, were kind of rather like hidden, rather like, the, they, they reminded me of the, the beer halls here, where very dark and you, you weren't allowed to see if you went into a beer hall. You just drank, and we were very quiet about it, and so nobody could see you drinking or being sinful. And no woman was allowed anywhere near them in those days. Oh, God. It all had the same feeling, that life was, and art were both being stifled. And then suddenly Toronto, you know, came alive. Yeah. Going back again, that reminds me, were you at the MRT when they had the studio at the rehearsal hall, which supposedly was an indoor golf course at one time? So <laughs> uh, it's hard to imagine. Uh, at the MRT? Yeah, it might have been prior to when you were there. 
you've been talking to this Herbert Whitaker. Um, I don't remember that at all, being, being in the interior of a golf course. I remember it was on, I do remember it was on Guy Street and it was in a little old building. And I think it had moved, it had been somewhere else before. And my mum was a great friend of, of Martha Allen's who, who started the whole thing. Um, but I, did, I never met Martha because she died before I sort of came on the scene. While you were there also you went and I don't know how many times you went to perform at Bray Manor, but there is a story of uh, you being a last minute replacement. Yes, I was a last minute replacement for, ah, can't remember his name, some actor. Uh, and that's how I met uh, Malcolm Morley, the English director, who had, was directing out there. And of course, those two wonderful people, Phil Moore and Madge Sadler, who are pillars of our history. The uh, whole thing should be written about them. Maybe, maybe it has, but I doubt it, uh, because they were pioneers in this country. They encouraged the, if you go down, you probably have the list of people that worked in that company. They all became leading celebrities of, in their own right later on. Unbelievable. All those young people started there at Bray Manor in the Eastern Townships. And I staggered out there because <laughs> to take over somebody's part in the rivals. I played Falkland. I didn't, I had to go on in 24 hours. I didn't know a line. And I was very scared and very nervous until I totally dried on stage. And, and in, in, a, in a split second, you know, it's like drowning, I suppose. You think, oh my God, what am I going to do? This, is, this whole career is not for me. Uh, wait a minute. Um, and then something happens, nature takes over, and you say, wait a minute, yes, it is for me, God damn it, I'm not going to let this, this embarrassing moment kill it. So I will now ask for the line, out loud. And I said, what's the line, darling? And darling, who happened to be the friggin' little young teenager who was <laughs> prompting in the wings, was reading a comic book. She had the comic book on top of the script. So now she had to look for the place, right? <laughs> so I had a little, little ad lib, and uh, the audience started to laugh. And I suddenly thought, yeah, maybe this is for me, you know? Because <laughs> we departed from the script, and it was six, I learned how to ad lib that night. <laughs> that was fun. And that's how you, get, you got to Ottawa. Through, uh, yes, because Malcolm thought I'd got myself out of trouble. I might as well really get into trouble in Ottawa. So he, he got me there. I started off as a, 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 very menially as a sort of assistant stage manager and prop man. Can you, I couldn't believe that title. And uh, worked myself up to leading actors <laughs> quickly because I was hopeless at those other two things. Who was in the company, like Betty Layton? Uh, Betty Layton and wonderful light comedian called Derek Ralston, who was probably this country's best light comedian. I mean, he was, he was like Rafe Lynn, actually. I do, you don't know who I'm talking about. Rafe Lynn was a special sort of farceur in England who, who, with Tom Walls, wrote all those, appeared in all those wonderful Philip King plays, See How They Run, and uh, all those wonderful Aldrich farces. That, and Rafe Lynn was this sort of uh, zany, very light uh, comedian, lighter even than Rex Harrison, that kind of... Uh, um, whimsical light comedian, and Derek was our answer to that sort of thing here. He was absolutely brilliant. Cary Grantish, uh, he could handle all that stuff uh, very well. So all the plays of, by Philip Barry and all the farces and, uh, and Lord Peter Whimsies and uh, all those parts he played with just, and we never knew our lines because we only had a, five days to do each play. It was un insane. And yet, Derek somehow was able to kind of ad-lib them all. <laughs> Nothing was on the, he wasn't saying anything from the text, except that he would remember the really good lines and the good laughs, that he was clever and canny enough to do that. But then he would be able to off on a tangent, and it all worked. He was very charming and very elegant, and, and he had a great style, which again was rare in Canada. A sort of style was rare. And, uh, I think we all learned it and, and, and wanted to bring it to, to this uh, country from the stage because only, they'd only 
they kept telling us how stylish the English were and the French and films that we were getting all the time. I said, well, how we are too. Come on, fellas. And uh, I think we were determined to show them that we could be just as stylish as we want. It, was a, it must have been a tremendous grounding for you, I mean, in the sense that you did like 75 roles. I mean, as you, you were mentioning oh. the fact that you were doing... What was it like? It must have been totally insane to be rehearsing, doing a play, rehearsing another one. I mean, you must lose track. <laughs> well, of course. I mean, totally insane and hilariously funny. And that little uh, Ottawa audience that came every night, unbelievable. I don't know how they put up with us because they finally got to understand and sympathize. So they, were kind of, they would kind of look for these awful, embarrassing moments and then share in them. And if we f broke up on stage, which we did constantly out of sheer terror and hysteria, they would break up too. They, they'd forgiven us. And they came nevertheless. I, they were gallant. They deserved medals. They'd come through snowstorms to see a bunch of idiot actors not say the text. <laughs> Very funny, very sweet, actually. Um, I think that I would rather have, um, I'm very happy I grew up in that era. I would hate to be a young actor now, growing up because we had so much more, uh, we had such a, 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 a huge canvas and a variety to choose from in those days. And there was so much more work. Uh, now it's, it's, it's really a hard, a hard trip for someone young to come up because their careers vanish so quickly. There's no insurance policy sort of behind it uh, that the theater or radio or other media bring, give you, you know. There's only one thing now, television or the movies, television or the movies, and, and uh, if you're lucky enough to get into a hot movie, then you'd get maybe two more and then bye-bye. And they can't go back to the stage and, and um, spend some wonderful moments of their life earning their living in something they love doing. I, I think it was a good era to grow up in. Tough, but very valuable. You were given the opportunities, too. When you were in Mount Plays, was that the first time you met Barry Morris? And did you actually perform with him? Yes, I did. Um, I was in Present Laughter with, with him. Um, so was Jack Creeley. And, um, oh God, who else? I, I mean, I, I can't remember that. No, Bill Shatner, I don't think was in uh, Present Laughter, but I think he was there, he was there. Bill Shatner was everywhere in those days, but I can't quite remember. And Barry Morse was wonderful. And he was a sort of a guest star, really, from England that had just arrived. And he was extremely, extremely good. That was a successful little company. Barry Morse was also a wonderful radio actor. He could do a, a big variety. So he was embraced by the stage people and uh, the, the um, stage series and Andrew Allen. And, and he was used all the time and became a very, very valuable member of that close-knit group. You know. that, unlike maybe some of the other, that, that theater on Beaver Lake was quite spectacular. It was in a beautiful setting. The Rosanna Todd's theater was, was more beautiful because it was open air and we used the sort of mound that was by, by Beaver Lake, the, the little mountain, and people would lose their entrances all the time and you'd, you'd have to wait because you get lost actually coming through the brush. You've got to always go home late at night and find a couple of fairies back there in their little costumes necking with one of the soldiers. They still had, had no time to get out of their costume. It's kind of sweet. They just stayed on and had a party, you know, after the show was over. Uh, that was a gorgeous setting, although I'm not crazy about playing outdoors, because the sound is always such a, a bugbear. Beautiful and magical though it looks, it's, you've got to hear the sound resonantly. And uh, it's very pretty dry outdoors. <laughs>